as a strategic affairs expert. His research and experience makes him well equipped to share the real story and some left out details from the Ellie Cohen Netflix hit. Thanks for joining us tonight. And I hand it over to ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Yaakov Selavan. Okay, so uh, can you hear me? We're good, just go with your yeah. hand. Okay, wonderful. Um, you spoke about my greatest accomplishment. I need to make sure not to wake them up uh, <laughs> or else my wife kicks me out of the house. So um, first of all, uh, good evening, everyone. By me, it's uh, we'll see the sun rising behind me very soon. Um, those who, I don't know if anyone, I saw Chabad of West Hills, so maybe some of you, maybe we've met before, but uh, usually I speak very enthusiastic and loud, and now it's going to be a challenge. So I hope you forgive me. Um, talking about the greatest accomplishment, again, before I introduce myself, uh, after all of this being said, um, I'll just say that uh, I want to start with the story. This past Yom HaTzmaut, Israel's Independence Day, uh, my wife gave birth to our third uh, girl. So we were in the hospital during Memorial Day, Yom HaZikaron, and then Yom HaTzmaut. When Yom HaTzmaut was over, I was already home, back home with my uh, two older daughters. And my friend, who's a chef, came and threw a barbecue. Okay, now we're sitting right outside this window here. We're sitting, you know, you made this amazing barbecue. And while we're sitting and talking, uh, two helicopters fly over our heads, okay? Now, we look up, we said, okay, my friend says to me, okay, you know, we're in the Golan. It's known, it's one of the IDF's largest training zones in Israel. So the Israeli Air Force is pulling together, you know, a drill. I said to him, listen, I, I've been in the army enough years to know that on Yom Ma'ut, it's, uh, it's a day you don't train. Aside from operational missions, it's just like Shabbat, it's a holiday. You don't do anything, meaning something is, uh, here I see someone asked me to speak up, I'll try putting my head closer, okay? So uh, I said to him, listen, this must be something operational because uh, the IDF doesn't train in such days. So, you know, we keep on eating and two minutes later, we literally see missiles flying from the air into Syria, okay? Now, I live uh, four miles away from uh, the border. So we literally see the, 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 these mysterious helicopters firing into Syria. What's the next thing we'll do? I took the salt and the pepper, I put it on my intricot, and I continued eating, okay? Um, and then what happened 10 minutes later? I took out this little thing here called a smartphone. Okay, I'm in Israel, so I have a Samsung. You guys probably have an Apple. And I started going through Facebook, through Instagram, and through Telegram. Within 10 minutes, I knew exactly what targets were shot in Syria. No, not apricot, entricot. I hope I'm not pronouncing it uh, properly. Entricot, good meat steaks. On my steak, okay? On my steak, on my steak, sorry. Um, and... After the salt and pepper, as I said, I just did 10 minutes of research on social media, both of us, and we knew exactly what Iranian targets were struck in Syria, what Syrian army unit base was hosting these Iranians, and who died, more or less, okay? 10 minutes on social media. Why am I starting with this? Because when we come to talk about the story of Eli Cohen, we need to put it in context because if I take now today a teenager, I'm, I'm, I'm going through the faces right now through the gallery view, but I'm not saying, uh, I don't say any teenager right now. So if, if I say, for example, a teenager and I try explaining to him the story, he'll say, it's so pathetic. This guy is our man in Damascus. I mean, I, I can find it out. Everything is here today. This is how you collect intelligence today, open source intelligence, OSINT. So what, what, did Ellie really do something so special for our country? So that's the first thing I'll say is that, remember, we are talking about the 60s. We're not talking about 2020. We're, when I want to build my intelligence picture as an officer, 
the last thing I do is I go to the classic military abilities because I have so much happening around me before. Um, and with that, with all of that said, there are different things that Ellie did in 1960, which could have been very effective also today. So when I end my talk, I'm going to talk about his real accomplishments, not what Netflix showed. Uh, and just when I, again, 90% of what I'm going to show you there is something I probably would be able to gather here today. But in 1960, uh, I'll say the 10% that was missing is something that could prevent wars today also. So with that said, um, so my name is uh, Yaakov Selvan. I'm from the Golan. They gave you all of my professional background. I live here in this beautiful place in the top northeast of Israel, in the Golan. And I'll just say, for since I was already uh, introduced in Lent and I saw the nice uh, uh, landing page that was made for this incredible event, so I'll just say one thing about my professional background. Um, my current job in the IDF, which I've been doing for, let's see, almost seven years now, since the 2014 war in Gaza, is a combat operations officer. Uh, a combat operations officer is a combat officer. I served as a company leader commanding 11 tanks. And in the headquarters today, and in IDF headquarters, I don't know if you've seen it before, we're talking about a brigade's headquarters, which is out in the field, not nice air conditioned offices like you see in the movies. Um, my job basically today, the IDF has incredible abilities. We're talking about cyber, intelligence, radio systems, logistics, etc. And we have the tanks. We are an armored brigade. I have the tanks in the front line with a young 20, 22 year old commanders in it. And when you're in the front line and the dust in your eyes and it's muddy and, and you're tired, it's very hard to make decisions, first of all, which is something which is true also for 70 years ago. But mainly, it's very hard to get the broad picture. And my job is to basically give that tank in the front line the full, I would say, basket of abilities the idea has. It's very nice to have cyber. If I can't help the commander in the front line, you know, uh, get some benefits from the cyber abilities, then it's not worth anything. He'll still be there blind in the front line, not understanding what's happening around him. So my job is with, and I can tell you the last time I did it was just last week, from Sunday to Thursday. Um, we integrated into our unit a new uh, advanced system I would say controlling system, uh, the most advanced one in the world, digital system that basically helps us take all of the intelligence picture and inject it down to the guys in the front line. So that's what we trained for for a week. We integrated this new system. And basically, if once, uh, uh, I would say once, 47 years ago, the 1973 war, uh, a tank commander would search with his uh, binoculars for the enemy and try understanding where's the enemy coming from today in an era that's very different with a disappearing enemy the enemy is hiding underground the enemy is hiding behind people uh, the idf has different tools to build a very good intelligence picture and my job is to sift it very quickly with the intelligence officers and decide what will be attacked how will be it how will it be attacked am i going to use the air force am i going to use drones am i going to bring it down to the soldiers in the front line and help the guys in the front line with all these abilities, really understand what to focus on, what to attack, what not to attack, so we can really um, uh, benefit from all the incredible abilities the IDF has. So that's my connection to the intelligence world. I'm not an intelligence person originally, uh, but I do work on a daily basis, I can say now with intelligence. And when you live on the Syrian border and you give geopolitical briefings, you must live the inside of what's happening in, uh, I would say in the Syrian quagmire, but that's a different topic. So that's the professional background. With that said, uh, what are we going to do tonight? So tonight, today, it's funny for me to say tonight. So we're gonna talk about one of the most uh, famous Israelis, I think, uh, in the world, Eli Cohen. And the way we're going to do it is we're not just gonna go through his, the story of his life because that I can put you guys all on Google, I'll show my screen and we'll just read about him on Wikipedia. What I want to do is, first of all, talk a little bit about the intelligence world so we can get, again, more, con I started with it a little bit. I want us to get more context to Ellie's uh, achievements, to Ellie's work. Uh, then we'll talk about what was his mission? Why was Syria, the country he operated in for three years, why was that the top priority for Israel in those years? Uh, we'll talk, we'll give a brief review of his life and what did he actually do? 
And I think what would be very interesting is to talk about how was he caught, which is something that there have been recent uh, uh, new reveals about different things about his story. How was he caught? Was there a chance to save him while he was uh, brought to jury? Um, and of course, myths and truth. We'll talk about Netflix. I love the show. I must say, first of all, before we talk, I love the show. Um, and still, we have to say, okay, what is true there? What's a myth? And maybe then we can talk about, we'll finalize with, before opening for questions, of course, with what were his true accomplishments? Because that's something that affects Israel's security till today. And that's something that we really need to understand after my opening story. Why was Eli so important? Why is he so important? So I'll start with a few terms in the military world, uh, in the intelligence world. And when I collect, when I build an intelligence picture, then I have different elements. Now I'm making it very, this is like a rough picture because many people can divide each one of what I'm gonna explain now to other pieces. Um, for example, OSINT, open source intelligence, um, WebInt, in intelligence from the open web, it's part of it, okay? These two go together. Um, open source intelligence is just what I did here on the phone. I can read newspapers, I can, you know, surf online, search for, for information that's out there, and that helps me to build an intelligence picture. Um, so that's the first thing, and as I showed you in my opening story today, it's something that's super, super crucial. Um, Visant, visual intelligence. Visual intelligence comes from two options. First of all, aerial footage, satellite footage, etc. But also as a commander in the front line, right? If I'm a tank commander in Gaza and I see things happening and I report back, I'm, gi I'm giving visual intelligence. When I sat here and ate my steak and watched the attack, if, if someone needed a report, I saw it. I can give visual intelligence. I'm, I'm, I'm a source for visual intelligence. Um, and then we have SIGINT, which is signal intelligence, which is all these things we see about following signals and radio lines and different things. Uh, cyber would probably be a large, uh, I would put cyber under a few of these categories, but uh, cyber helps us really put our hands at good signal intelligence. And last but not least, I marked it is human, human intelligence. Now, you don't have to agree with what I'm going to say now, but I claim that all of these, of course, are crucial. I can't say what's more important than the other, but if I can say that human intelligence uh, is different than the rest, it's to the strategic level. Human intelligence will probably doesn't make such a big difference for me as a commander in the front line. It will make the biggest uh, and it will have the biggest influence on the decision makers. And I'll show you in a second an ex a current example from today. But if I have a man on ground or a man in the right position who can really sense what is happening on field, not by phone calls, not by the TV, not by different rumors. He knows the people who are making the decisions and he reports back. That can be the difference between war and things calming down. And let's give an example. Who watched CNN today? Um, so here I took a, a screenshot, right? Uh, Ron vows retaliation for killing of top nuclear scientists. Guys, are we, is the Middle East, I don't know if you guys understand, is this far away from going to war? It all depends on very, very few Iranian people. Maybe I would even say one Iranian person, Khamenei, right, the religious leader. And he needs now to decide what are his intentions. Does he want to escalate or will he bite his tongue and wait till uh, January when Joe Biden comes into office, okay? Now, the American uh, administration is also looking at him and trying to understand what are his intentions. And one little miscalculation between one of the sides can lead you to a war all around the Middle East. Now imagine that the president of the United States has someone with his ears in Khamenei's office, someone who can tell him what is the religious re leader really seeking. Forget what he tweets, forget what he says, what does he really want? Does he want to go to war? Will he handle it, right? That makes a difference to your next action. In 2006, Israel, I'm giving you now the last two wars, which I was part of. In 2006, Israel 
spent 34 days in Lebanon in a bloody war called the Second Lebanon War. It began with kidnapping of two Israeli soldiers on the northern border. Look at what Hassan Asala, the leader of Hezbollah, says just two weeks after the war in an interview. He says, I miscalculated. I didn't understand the Israeli intentions. If I would know that kidnapping two soldiers would lead me to war, in which I'll lose so much, he says, I wouldn't have done it. And we are talking about the biggest mouth in the Muslim world, and he says, I wouldn't have done it. I miscalculated, meaning I did not understand the intentions of the other side. And Nasala hasn't attacked us since, and he knows why, because he understands that he miscalculated our intentions. And you know, so we're very happy with ourselves. Now look, he, he messed up, but now let's look at ourselves. 2014 in Gaza, 51 days we were there in the Gaza quagmire. Um, and I remember, I remember each time we want to go in and we're told one second, we're not going in. And I open up uh, my, the news on the phone and I check it. And it says Israeli officials think Hamas doesn't want to escalate. Israeli officials understand Hamas is not looking for war. And each time, the war went on for 51 days, second longest war in the history of, the, of, uh, of, uh, of, of Israel. From independence war, there's not such a long war because we miscalculated our enemies' intentions. We kept on thinking they're doing different actions, but they really intend one thing and they intended the other. Meaning the missing spice for Nasrallah in 2006 and for us in 2014 was to understand the intentions. Okay, so with that opening now, Let's dive into the story. Now it will become more interesting. So when we talk about Eli Cohen, as I said, uh, his mission is in Syria. Why was Syria, you can see Syria here, and let's say I don't block it, we see the, the Golan here, and you see the map here that the Golan is part of here, let me, let me mark it. Uh, up to 1967, the Golan is part of the Syrian Republic. Now, what's so, uh, important in Syria. So Syria is a very, till today, by the way, very, I would say, turbulent country. I'm not here to give you a geopolitical briefing. We can talk about the fact that it's an artificial state with different minorities, with a majority that's oppressed by the minorities, etc. But the bottom line is that this country, doesn't get up to these numbers, from its uh, independence, uh, uh, when they declare their own independence in 1941, they were recognized a few years later, until 1961, they, there were over 20 coups in Syria. Only in the late 50s, there were 18 coups, meaning you can go to sleep uh, one night and you wake up the next day and there's been two coups overnight. Now, these guys are sitting on your border and you have no idea what's happening. There's so many inner politics. There's so many different uh, forces, you know, pulling the strings and, Israel was blind. Israel couldn't understand what is the heck is happening on our northern border. Now, if you look at the late 50s, so down south, we have Egypt, we have our challenges there, but we're by the desert, right? So even if Israel would, if Egypt would invade Israel, you have, right, you have some, I would say, uh, some land to lose, you're in the desert. Let's look now at the Golan and let's look now at the northern border. When I look at Syria, and its effect on Israel. So let's look here at the Golan, where I live today. And Golan Heights, look what the height is controlling. First of all, it controls the Hula Valley. We'll see in a second the picture. We'll see how dramatic this is, meaning Syrian soldiers sitting here in the closed military zone of the Golan are controlling everything happening down here in the valley. More importantly, friends, we're talking about the Middle East, a dry region and the Golan controls the most important thing when you talk, not the most important thing, but one of the crucial things when you talk about national security for the young state of Israel in the late 50s, water. The Sea of Galilee is controlled absolutely by the Golan. The waterheads of the Sea of Galilee begin right, some of them in the Golan and some right under the Golan. If I sit here, I control the water. And the Syrians understood that. And the Syrians used that as a card against us. And Israel's planning, right? We're talking about the route leading water from the Kina to the Negev, a national project. It's under threat by the Syrians constantly. 
So we're talking about Syrians making life miserable in northern Israel. And you see that in episode one of The Spy. And you talk about water. And now you understand why it is so urgent for the Israeli government to have someone in there who will give you a full intelligence picture of what, pow what are the power bases? How are decisions being made? How can we have an effect on the decisions being made in order to bring security to northern Israel and in order to prevent the Syrians taking over the water? And one last picture, and then we'll talk about Eli himself. Here's a picture from the Golan. Look how the Sea of Galilee and the Kibbutzim are right under you. Uh, and this is En Gev, a small kibbutz under the Golan. And this kibbutz, uh, there's a, an amazing, uh, for me as someone who lives here, um, in episode one, if you recall, there is a scene where the farmers are working their lands by the Sea of Galilee, and then there's an artillery attack by the Syrians, and people die and people are injured. And that was reality for 19 years, from 1948 to 1967, the uh, liberation of the Golan by Israeli troops in the Six Day War, which I'll talk about also at the end. Uh, 19 years, life in Northern Israel under the Golan, they called it the Dark Mountains, was hell. Israeli poets wrote songs about the girls growing up in bomb shelters. If you think about Gaza, the Gaza envelope today, same thing. A Syrian soldier wakes up in the morning, he's pissed off because I don't know what his girlfriend broke off from him takes his mortar shell rocket and starts shooting at Northern Israel. And that's it, the whole place is locked down. You can't go to school, you're in the bomb shelter, et cetera, et cetera. So that's reality. And with that reality, between 1958 and 1961, something very dangerous is happening in the North. Syria decides to join Egypt to what we call the United Arab Republic. They become one Republic. Egypt is the dominant, Egypt is a leader. Uh, the deputy, oh, well, my girls are waking up. Uh, the deputy is Syrian, and now things become even more dangerous and more confusing for Israel. And that leads us to the man who's supposed to give an answer to all this, and that is Eli or Eliyahu Cohen. So I'll say briefly that, again, I'm not here to give you Wikipedia. Uh, if I look at Eli Cohen, I'll give you four main stops. Egypt, where he grew up as a son to Syrian immigrants, meaning his parents came from Aleppo, from Syria, moved to Egypt, and he was born in Alexandria in 1924. His aliyah to Israel, his first mission to Argentina, and his final mission, Syria. Uh, again, I'm not here to give you a, a uh, biography. I just want to focus on each one of these stops, maybe shed light on some interesting points. Let me start from Egypt, from his childhood. Two things that are interesting for me, uh, when you look at Eli Cohen, his Egyptian part, um, first of all, his brothers say that as a, as a child already, they noticed he had a phenomenal memory. He would sit down, uh, you know, in the, in the markets of, of Alexandria, and he said, his brother says, we sit down and we look at the road. It's a very main, it's a city with a port, so, right? You have cars and everything driving there. And he says, and suddenly when we go home, Eli starts memorizing to me, saying by heart, all of the license plates of the cars that drove by us in the last hour. The guy had incredible memory. And that is something, of course, for a spy uh, that is very useful. Uh, the second thing is, wait, let me say good morning to my little daughter. <laughs> mission, mission failed. Tegidi shalom. lishon. Okay, my wife's going to kill me. Uh, <laughs> the second thing is, this is for, I'm in a Chabad program, so I got to say uh, that Eli was a star student in Judaics. Actually, the leader of the Jewish community, of, of the community's family, you know, the synagogue his family went to, uh, had plans for him. He was supposed, Eli was actually supposed to go learn uh, Judy, uh, study Jewish studies in Italy and be ordained as a rabbi there. But because of World War II, he had to he had to stay in Egypt and he said, okay, I'll go study electronics. Uh, but maybe, you know, maybe we wouldn't have been talking today about the next, the, the great rabbi Eli Cohen, who knows? Um, so Eli stays in Egypt, he studies electronics. And in 1949, we're talking about a few months after the state of Israel is established, uh, most of the Jews in Egypt leave. They, are kicked out and they go to Israel, Eli's family makes Aliyah, Eli stays behind. Now, 
If you Google it, you'll see that Eli Cohen stayed behind because he was finishing his degree and he had a job, etc. cetera. Uh, he makes Aliyah only in 1957, except two things happen on the way. 1954, a very famous incident, uh, an Israeli spy network is caught, is revealed in Egypt. Uh, two Israeli spies are hung. Others go to jail, some commit suicide. Uh, the Israeli government quit, uh, um, resigns because of the, this thing had such a big effect. And what people don't know is that Eli Cohen was actually uh, in, interrogated by, this, by the Egyptian intelligence then because one of the guys who was hung lived in the apartment Eli Cohen rented. So there was some, something fishy there. Now Eli Cohen is off the hook. So he continues his life there. But in 1957, he's called again by the Egyptian intelligence. And he understands that he, it's time to leave, and he comes to Israel. 20 years after Eli was hung, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, of blessed memory, reveals in a ceremony that in those years, Eli was undercover, an undercover agent in Egypt, uh, helping Jews to make Aliyah, meaning he stayed behind his family, not because he wanted to finish his degree, because he wanted to help the rest of the Jews. He was looking out for his brothers. And so he was there to help Jews and he had some connections with the Mossad. And that's why he was also targeted by the Egyptian intelligence. So he escapes Egypt and he comes to Israel in 1957 uh, and, and he starts working for the Mossad. For the Mossad, He applies, he fills the forms, he applies uh, to be an agent. And I'm not sure, uh, I'm not, I, I can't recall right now what happens in the series when he applies, if he applies. I'll say that, first of all, his applications are held today by the Mossad, and he writes about himself. He can speak five languages, including three dialects of Arabic. Okay, Arab, Arabic has different dialects. When you go into Israel, even, you can find the difference between Gaza and Hebron and, and the Galilee. So he can speak Egyptian Arabic. He can speak Syrian Arabic because of his parents. And that is something that's very necessary for an agent. But he's rejected. He's rejected for two reasons. The known reason is that the Egyptian intelligence already has information about him. You can't send this guy to an Arab country, right? I mean, you have an Arab intelligence body that knows about him. But what people don't know is that the uh, uh, graphologist and the psychologist that evaluated, that looked at his applications were able to say that he lacks in his sense of, of danger. He's unaware of danger. Uh, he's over self-confident. And that's something very dangerous for an agent if he doesn't understand that danger is coming at him. And remember that when we talk about his end. So uh, he, he works in the Mossad as an open source intelligence, uh, um, not even analyst. His job is to just listen to, uh, you know, different uh, radio channels. He's, he reads Arab newspapers and he, he writes down different things. He spoke about OSINT. And then he's fired. He's fired not because he's an immigrant, he's fired because the budget is shrinking, so he's fired. He goes to work as a clerk. In 1959, he gets married to Nadia, uh, who is uh, over a decade older than. And in 1960, he's fired from his job as a clerk and the Mossad hires him again. There are rumors which haven't been proven that the Mossad made sure he'll get fired in order uh, to be able to hire him. And he's hired by the Mossad and he goes through intensive training. Uh, as you, we see also in the series, different, different things. Uh, and then he, is, he gets his cover story. He, when he starts training, he doesn't know where, he's, where they're aiming, you know, where, where, did, where they wanted to go. And then in 1961, he is sent to Argentina. His cover story, as we all know from the spy, is uh, Kamel Amin Thabet. Here's his, a real business card of his. And his job in Argentina, there's a large Arab community um, of people you know, who, who left Syria, who left the region. And his job is to blend in, to build his cover story as a very wealthy man, a businessman who, uh, you know, who has, um, his parents died and he's waiting to get all the money. I, I forgot the word now, Yerusha. I forgot the word in English, it's an early hour. Um, and he starts, he starts blending in. He was supposed to go for three months. They extended it for half a year because no one in the Mossad believed. There were, there were, 
inheritance, thank you. Um, no one in the Mossad believed that this guy that had some question marks on him would be so successful. But Eli, in that half a year, his cover story is too good to be true. He connects with journalists. He connects with very, uh, you know, with, um, with different journalists, with uh, uh, different media people. He, he blends with the, you know, the ordinary people in the, in the market and some very wealthy and connected people. And he starts building his resume. His name is going around. And that would lead him to meet maybe his greatest accomplishment in Argentina, uh, the new military attache. Uh, talking about coups, there is a very strong guy in Syria and the Syrian army and the current leadership in Syria wants him away from power. They send him to Argentina far away to be the military attache. His name is Amin El Hafez. You see his real picture and then you see him in the series. And Eli connects them. They're not best friends. Uh, he, I, from what I know, he didn't really write a recommendation letter for him, but there's some sort of connection there. He knows of him. And he gets a lot of recommendation letters. He gets uh, uh, connections. People tell him, when you go to the, he tells everyone, I want to go back to Damascus. I want to go to see my homeland. I want to help it, you know? And when he goes back to sit, when he's sent, he goes back to Israel for vacation and his first daughter is going to be born, but he has a suitcase full of recommendation letters and people, you know, business cards, people, when you go to Damascus, please go to my brother-in-law, tell him I sent you, he'll make sure to show you around Damascus, right? So many people. So he goes back to Israel, completes his training. People are very satisfied with him in Israel. People can't believe how, how successful he was. And in January, 1962, he goes into Syria. On his way, this, again, there's arguments. Uh, was this planned? Was this random? Uh, on the ship, right, while he goes from Italy through Alexandria to Syria, he meets a very important man, which will be his, uh, I would say, key, his entrance key to Syria, Sheikh Majid el Ard, which you see here, the actor, and here's the, the real guy during the trial. This guy is a very uh, corrupt and rich businessman. It's a very interesting history. And Eli connects them. And he tells him, yeah, you know, he, said, he asks Eli randomly on the boat, you know, how are you go going into Syria? And Eli says, you know, I'll take the train. Whatever. And he says, no, 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 I have a new car. Just like you see in the series. I have connections. I'll get you in. And that's a bingo for Eli. That's a bingo for Eli because this guy already sniffs that Eli's a rich guy and he wants to connect them. And he will be his key, he will be his entrance into Syria and into uh, the power bases in Syria. One thing I want to tell you that wasn't revealed in the series, Sheikh Majd al Arid was a CIA agent. So that opens again, there's so many speculations, so many rumors, but many people claim that the CIA helped Eli get into Syria. And when Eli was caught, it was just two months after a few CIA agents were hung in Damascus. So maybe his... He was so close to this Sheikh, uh, Majd al -Arad, that maybe this was also something that was actually his downfall. So he leads him into Damascus. Now, I'm not going to start going with you month by month. I'll just say for the next three years, from January uh, 1962 to 1965, Eli is in Damascus. Now, how successful was he, was he there? How connected was he? So I'll just show you this picture from 1964. Okay, Eli is here behind. You see the five people here in front? Here's Amin al Khafiz, who becomes, remember, the military attache in 1963, uh, the Ba'ath coup. He becomes president. Remember, Eli knows him. So Eli is now invited to all official events in the palace. And you see here by him the interior minister and different ministers. These are the top five politicians in Syria in 1954, and Eli Cohen is walking up the steps with him. Eli made good friends with the nephew of the chief of staff, Muaz al Adin, which we see in the series. We'll see a picture in a second. He makes very close connection with very high military officials from the Air Force, from the logistics, uh, the commander of the commando, the special forces of the Syrian army lives in Eli's house, basically, when he wants to cheat on his wife, he comes to Eli's house. Eli hosts parties. When he goes away for business travels, 
He gives his keys to different officials who want to bring women to his home, and there's parties there and everything. Um, and, and it's unbelievable. He Till today, people study Eli Cohen's things because if you want to understand how to work as a spy, just look at those three years, not including the last months. It's just unbelievable to see how brilliant he was, how he was able to use every little piece of information against the person in front of him to, to get information out of him. And he's close to the president and he's close to top ministers and he is able to report to Israel. He becomes, uh, people called him as a joke in Israel. The intelligence official called him the Damascus, uh, uh, I would say like New York Times, Damascus Times. Everything happening within the power bases in Syria is invisible to the Israeli government. Your decision-making becomes 10 times better. And if there's one case, again, we can talk so much about things that happen. So first of all, Eli visited the Golan five times. This is Muaz al azar al-Din, the nephew of the uh, Syrian chief of staff, who Eli becomes, he becomes Eli's greatest source of information. You know, Eli as a rich patriot who wants to help. Uh, this guy, you know, keeps on saying, Eli says, I'm worried about the Israelis, uh, I don't know, attacking us in the Golan. He says, no, don't worry, Eli, come, I'll take you to the border so you can see in your own eyes that there's no chance the Israelis can attack us. And he takes Eli. And different things that happened. And, you know, Israel, there was a, I'll show you in a second, there was a, a clashing at the border. And Eli says, I'm worried about the morale of the troops in the front line. He says, come, I'll show you the troops in the front line. And then Eli can report what were the actual results of this uh, military clash. So Eli visits the Golan five times. And here we see one more picture from the series, but now look at this picture. Eli in the center, this is Muaz Azar al Adin, the nephew, who is also a lieutenant in the Syrian army, and another unknown person. Here is Eli, and look what's behind him, the Khul Valley. Eli, when he comes back to Israel for his first vacation, he writes down, he has documents, he writes down, he says, I felt like Moses and Mount Nebo, looking at the promised land. He said, I just, I wanted to just run down there and just go back home. And, and I couldn't because I'm on mission, but it's something very moving when you see how he writes it. I felt like Moses and Mount Nebo. So Eli operates there. And if you want to understand, talking about intentions, if there's one case I want to choose, and then we'll talk about how he was he caught, then I want to talk about uh, March 1962, a battle called the Battle of New Cave. The Battle of New Cave is a clash between Syrian troops and Israeli troops by the Kinneret. Following uh, a Syrian attack, the famed Golani Brigade is sent to attack in a Syrian outpost, which is overlooking the Sea of Galilee and the slopes of the Golan. It is a very successful operation for Israel. However, a few soldiers are killed. One body is kidnapped. Three Israeli armored vehicles are left in the field. And the Syrians, who lost dozens of soldiers, need to show the people at home uh, you know, uh, the, the effect of public opinion, etc. cetera, uh, they need to show they were successful. We see it in the series, by the way, that the Syrians bring burnt vehicles to the heart of Damascus. If you remember, I think it's episode two or three, Eli walks in the streets and literally sees lots of people and there's dead bodies there. So what really was there is that they brought the burnt vehicles to show how successful they were. Now, this conflict led to an escalation. And... The Israeli government is ready to go to war. That's what they understand. They think the Syrian uh, um, chief of staff is interviewed and he says, uh, we won this battle, but it's not enough. And we will attack Israel again, et cetera, et cetera. And things start escalating. Eli is there, connected. Remember, he has an ear by the chief of staff. He has ears on the government table. And he understands that the Syrians want to just let this thing be forgotten and continue. And Eli is able to give a perfect analysis of what is happening, the power bases in, this, in the Syrian government and the Syrian army, and it's a bingo. Israel understands we're not going to war. Now, remember we spoke about intentions? Look what happens here. I have someone who can really understand what's happening from the inside. And for me as a strategic decision maker, if I'm the Israeli government, I understand that I'm not going to war. This, the, this is a life and death effect, right? Am I sending more soldiers for another operation or am I waiting? Because the Syrians don't want war. Eli understands the Syrian intentions 
and he reports it back home. He operated for three years, three vacations in between. And here we come uh, to Eli's end. Uh, Ahmed Swidani, true picture, picture from the series, uh, is the head of the Syrian intelligence. And he is very worried about information leaking. It rose attention in Syria because in several occasions, Israeli radio channels reported things happening in Syria before they were even posted in Syria. Things happening in the parliament, things, people being appointed. And they understand it's leaking and they start checking around. Eli comes back to Israel in October 64 because his, his third son, he had two daughters, Sophie and Irit, and his third son, Shaul Shai, is, uh, his wife is about to give birth, so he comes back to Israel. When he comes back to Israel just two weeks before, uh, you know, he had a signal that he was supposed, if he is now under threat, he needed to give that signal. Eli gave that signal. The Israeli intelligence system is panicking. What happened to Eli? And then Eli reports again and says, everything's under control. But that already is a red light, a red flag, I would say. It's a warning. What is happening to our man in Damascus? When he comes back to Israel, his wife, Nadia, says he wasn't Eli. He was, Eli was a, a man who had a lot of self-control, very calm, very, it was very pleasant to be around him. He says the guy, he was yelling, he was screaming, he, his temper, it, it wasn't Eli we know, he was very nervous. And she, she said, I felt like this man's fate is gone. Nadia knew, and Eli never said, but Nadia already knew he's in Damascus. Different mistakes Eli made, she knew he's in Damascus. And he kept on hugging her and saying, take care of the kids, please. And, and he went to his mother. It, it felt like he's saying goodbye to everyone. While Eli was in Israel, the Syrian intelligence already understands he's a spy. They thought he was Egyptian or Iraqi. They broke into his apartment, which was overlooking, by the way, the Syrian uh, military headquarters, and they went through it. When Eli came back to Damascus, he knows they went through his apartment. He knows he's, the spotlight's on him. The neighbors who loved him were keeping away from him, so I understand that they understand the Syrian intelligence fishing around him. He was, but he continues reporting. And when you see the reports from his last few months, it feels like you have a man standing with his bare chest in front of people with guns, and he's saying, shoot me. Eli started reporting. Not, he was not allowed to report more than nine minutes a day because then he's in danger. He reported for 20 minutes, for half an hour, same hours he made, and, and the, the intelligence was unbelievable. So no one was able to stop him because the guy was, he, he was just spilling it on them. The, the intelligence officers in Israel said, we couldn't believe it. We had a question for him about the Syrian army and the way the, they're, they're set up in the Golan. And we would ask it in the morning. And by 4 p.m. we had an answer. He said the guy was working right and he was just reporting and reporting and reporting. And the Syrian Intelligence already has 200 reports and they can't understand where is it being reported from, but they know there's a spy. And there's different opinions. How was he caught? I'll just say, first of all, remember the CIA, meaning Maj Sheikh Al Arad, who was also about to trial as a CIA agent, and a few CIA agents were hung in Damascus two months before Eli. Another opinion is that the Egyptian intelligence recognized his pictures. You know, this guy is all over the place. He's a star in Syria. He has a talk show, uh, he has his little corner in a talk show. He's with the Syrian officials, and they say, one second, we know this guy. Um, but most people think that it was because Eli reported so much, the Indian um, uh, embassy, which was a building near Eli, kept on reporting to Syria that we can't report back to India because something's bothering our radio connections. And the Syrians were already scared of leaks, start going through the neighborhood with special machinery, special uh, equipment, excuse me, they got from the Soviets. And that leads to their understanding that Eli is a spy. And by the way, when they catch Eli, uh, he's in bed, he's listening to the radio, he's not reporting. That's not true. Only a few days later, they uh, use Eli's uh, Morse, Morse uh, his, his radio equipment uh, to write the Israeli government and say, we caught Eli Cohen. So there's a lot of questions about how is he caught? Ellie's family till today is very mad about it. Ellie, Ellie's family feels that Ellie is being blamed by the Mossad instead of the Mossad 
they feel the Mossad should have protected him and said, you're not going back to Syria. Okay, you must stay in Israel because the Syrians, it looks like he said, when he, when he came here, he met the prime minister, he met the chief of staff, and he said, Ahmed Swidani is suspecting me. I feel uncomfortable. Uh, but he says, but the mission is so important that I must go back. And Ellie's family feels that you, could, you should have said, no, you've done such an amazing job. You have three children now, you're 41 years old, stay home. But Ellie felt he, he needs just a little bit more. Um, I'm not here to criticize Ellie, God forbid. You know, I, who am I? Who are we to, to criticize such a man? But when I look at pure intelligence work, you understand that in his last three months, he made very crucial mistakes. Some will say, understanding it's his fate. He just decided to go to it, sort of like a suicidal mission and, and get the maximum out of it. And then he's caught. Um, so I'll just say about the trial. Um, many people always ask me, you know, couldn't Israel have done more? Why was it, you know, usually when you catch spies, here's Sheikh Majd al Arad, here's Muaz al Adin, the nephew of the chief of staff, and here's Ellie during trial. And people ask, I mean, usually, right, even, even in the Cold War, the United States and Russia and, and the USSR traded, right, uh, spies. You catch a spy, I catch a spy, we trade them. Why didn't the Syrians negotiate for it? So if there's one picture I can show you that's give you the perfect answer, then look at this picture. Remember, Ellie's hosting parties at his house. He's connecting to all the top officials in Syria. This is Ellie here, you know, wearing this mask and everything. This is Colonel Salah El Dali. He's the head of the jury in Ellie's trial. You understand? How much does Ellie know about this guy, right? Can this guy let Ellie go home and open his mouth? Now, Amin al Khafiz, the Syrian president, visits Ellie to interrogate. He says, he, 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 was, he died a few years ago, but he was interviewed. And he says, I'm the one who revealed Ellie was Jewish. Everyone thought he was Egyptian, right, a Muslim. And I interrogated him three times in jail and found out that he was Jewish. Guys, you caught a spy. You need the president of Syria to find out that he's Jewish. Why did Amin al Khafiz come three times to visit Ellie in prison? If you ask me, to reach an agreement. You don't open your mouth. I'll make sure you stay alive. Okay? We, 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 we see the protocols of the thing. Ellie sits in front of a jury. Two of its members were the biggest par party, you know, as the guys in his parties at home. And they ask Ellie, do you know anyone in this room? And Ellie looks at them in their eyes and says, no, I've never seen you in my life. Everyone knows it's a lie. Ellie is playing the game because he believes that they'll look out for him. If he won't give them in, they won't hang him. And he filled his side in the deal. They didn't. Why did they do it? First of all, if Ellie is sent home, if Ellie is in Israel and he can open his mouth, it's such an embarrassment to the Syrian regime. Guys, the president, the interior minister, this guy was all over. They, he, he was there. It's, it's a disgrace. Secondly, remember Syria and Egypt uh, were connected for three years and Syria broke off. There's a lot of tension between Egypt and Syria and the Egyptian media is loving every moment of the Eli Cohen story. Part of the myths we know today about Eli weren't built by Israel. They were built by the Iraqis, by the Lebanese, by the Egyptians. Every day in their newspapers, there's a new story about how embarrassing, what did Eli Cohen do to the Syrian regime, right? Israel's not talking, Eli's not talking. They're making up stories to make the Syrian regime look so bad. So look at this, how much pressure's on the Syrian regime to get rid of this guy, right? This is an embarrassment. Um, and the last thing is within, remember we spoke about the power bases, which Ellie was so good at analyzing, already in those days, the president, Amin al-Khafiz, who's more conservative and has a personal connection to Ellie, uh, is considering to allow Ellie to have, to bring Ellie to justice, right? To have, to allow Ellie to have a lawyer who will visit him, open up the trial so the whole world sees that the Syrian regime uh, works by justice. But Salah Jadid, the chief of staff, who will, a year later, bring Amin al-Khafiz down and take over, Salah Jadid says, no, this guy must be hung. 
And so Eli is caught between uh, politics between different Arab countries, be in the Syrian army, in the, between the Syrian power bases. He's in the middle. He has no chance. The Israeli government did everything from offering money to offering spies to, um, to even Amin al Khafez. They knew there's a coup being planned. They told him, we will tell you who's planning the coup and we will help you stop this coup. Just let keep Eli alive, put him in prison, sentence him for life, just keep him alive. And the Syrians wouldn't allow that. And uh, this is the final picture. I'm not going to show the picture of Eli being hung. Uh, this is Chacham Nisi Manduro Cohen, the chief rabbi of Damascus. Remember the opening uh, uh, scene of the show. The Syrian intelligence calls him in the middle of the night and brings him Eli. Since the Syrian government is not allowing Eli to see a lawyer, uh, and it looks bad, the whole world, the Pope asks them to bring Eli to justice and not hang him. So the minimum the Syrians do is his last will, they bring him in front of a jury when they sentence him to death, and they allow a few foreign reporters to be there. And they ask Eli, what's your last will, first of all? And he says, I'm a Jew, and I want to die as a Jew. So they go quickly and they bring the rabbi. The rabbi comes in the middle of the night, talking about past midnight, and he does with Eli the last prayer, Shema Israel and Vidui, confession. And the rabbi says, I was crying, I couldn't complete the words. And Eli, with his phenomenal memory and with his knowledge in Judaism, helped me. He says, Rabbi, this is what you need to say. And this is what I have to say. He says, the guy is, is going to die in an hour. And he's giving me orders. Okay, do this, do that. And then Eli does something brilliant. You can take his life, you cannot take his dignity. When Eli was in, in trial, the Syrians already planned him being hung. It was a known, it, it, was a, it was a show, it was all play. And they made Eli write three letters in Arabic in which he writes to his wife, Nadia, and he says, Nadia, the state of Israel forced me to do this. It's an evil state, please leave Israel. He tells his children, leave Israel. There's no hope in this country. I betrayed the Arab, right? I'm an Arab, I came from Egypt, I betrayed them. I'm so sorry for it. I shouldn't have listened to the Zionist, right? And that's supposed to be used for Syrian propaganda. And Eli wrote those three letters, right, while they're beating him. And then there's a foreign reporter and a rabbi there. And then Eli says, I have one last request. I want to write a letter to my wife. And the Syrians can't say no. And that becomes Eli's final letter in Arabic and in French. He writes his real letter where he tells Nadia, he says, you're, you're free to marry another woman, another man, excuse me. He says, I'm sorry, but I did this for my country. Uh, a very, very moving letter. I won't read it out because I'll start crying. Uh, but Eli, in his last moment, doesn't allow the Syrian to take his dignity. They took his life, they didn't take his dignity. And he manages to write that letter and then the Syrians can take those three fake letters and throw it in the garbage because there's a real letter. So with that said, uh, what I want to do just before we open it for questions, I hope this wasn't too long. Um, this is, I think, maybe what we came here now after we gave the story and the end and the tragic end. Um, let's talk about the series, okay? Let's talk about the series. And I'm assuming everyone here watched the series. So I apologize if I'm assuming uh, something wrong. And then we'll talk about what is true. So first of all, the series, uh, I'll start with saying, Ellie's, co Ellie's family was asked, what do they feel about the series? And Nadia and Sophie, the oldest daughter said, uh, a lot of things when we watched it, we were very mad. A made dad, our father looked, looked bad, uh, different things, different things. I'm not gonna start going into specifics, but they said, we're still happy about the series because, because it, it brought Ellie back uh, to the front, uh, to the front, I guess you can say to the front page. Uh, to conscience. Suddenly, the whole world is talking about Eli Cohen. People are studying about him, right? When I watch the spy, I say, one second, this, look weird. This, this looks weird to me. Let me go research and learn the real story. So suddenly, um, so suddenly, uh, uh, you know, millions of people, I can even say around the world, are learning about Ellie and the true story. So the family is very appreciative for that. Um, so we have to start with that. I think the series did a very good job in showing Ellie's uh, dilemmas as an immigrant. I think they did different things to show, uh, we spoke about his lack of, uh, his unawareness of danger. It was uh, how eager he was to prove himself. 
So for example, they show he reaches Argentina, his first night in Argentina, he already steals maps from Amin al Khafiz and different things, which is not true, but it tried emphasizing to you, um, you know, that he, he was so eager to prove himself that that's what it led to his downfall eventually. So first of all, Ellie wasn't 007. The series makes the guy 007, right? He's jumping through windows, he's stealing this, he wasn't. Argentina, they showed him, you know, in the first night, as I said, stealing maps. Ellie was very low key in his first half a year. He made the right connections. He did not collect any intelligence. He did not report to Israel. He just reported who did he connect to. That's it. Remember, his goal is to make it to Syria. He wouldn't endanger himself in revealing himself in Argentina. The Ba'ath coup in uh, 1963. So it's shown as if Ellie invited the leadership, right? The chief of staff to his, to his party. And then uh, the coup went on, right? It's not true. Eli was very careful, even though he showed himself, he, he told people he's a big supporter of the Ba'ath party and he, he had uh, uh, dinners, right? Events, fundraising events, et cetera. Eli uh, was very careful not to take sides. Understanding there are so many inner conflicts in Syria, he was very careful not to take a side because if he would take a side, the other side would assassinate him. By the way, we saw it when he was in prison, as I said, in his, when he was brought to trial, we saw how suddenly he's caught between two forces who are fighting for power and he's caught in between. But he was very careful along his years not to do that. He wasn't part of the Ba'ath coup, okay? Uh, again, how was the myth born or what? Uh, the Arab world, right? It was very nice for other Arab countries to say those Ba'ath guys, Heli Cohen is the guy who brought them to power. It's not true. Golan fence, there's a scene during uh, Eli's visit to the Golan where he runs to the fence and warns an Israeli farmer that the Syrians will attack. It is true that a few times Eli gave live information that the Syrians will attack tonight because he was very connected uh, to the commander of the Golan region, but that never happened. Eli never came to the fence, never made an Israeli, no chance. Shalal, okay, Shalal. Uh, if you remember in the last episodes, the Syrian project of taking over uh, diverting the waterheads of the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, that did happen. Mohammed bin Laden was the uh, contractor who was supposed to take care of this project. He met Eli Cohen. By the way, he is Osama bin Laden's father. If you notice in the series, there's a part where Mohammed bin Laden tells Osama, he says, Osama, please go for a second. Eli never met Osama bin Laden. It was just to show, to emphasize to us who Mohammed bin Laden is. Uh, but Eli was revealed to this project. He, this is one of his greatest accomplishments, we'll show in a second. And it did allow Israel to destroy uh, uh, what we call the, the Waterhead uh, uh, Diversion Project. However, Eli never watched it live. Actually, it was bombed when Eli was uh, in trial. And again, talking about why Eli had no chance, that's maybe also one of the reasons. Think about it. Israel is trying to negotiate for him, and then Israel bombs all the Syrian equipment and takes over a national project of Syria. Um, and Eli knew about the project very well, but he wasn't so uh, inside the picture like it's shown in the series. And Eli was never offered to be a deputy minister. Again, rumors in the Arab world. He was very well connected. He was very close to people. He never got an offer to be to, for an official job as much as we know. Last but not least, here's the point where I end and I break your hearts. The eucalyptus trees, the most known story about Eli Cohen. I remember my first time in the Golan in second grade, driving up to the Golan, and our teacher says, you see these trees? These were planted by Eli Cohen to give away the Syrian bases. Guys, it's the greatest myth about Eli Cohen, but it's a myth. I don't want to disappoint you. The eucalyptus trees is not true, okay? It's not true. I see some people saying, oh, oh God. Uh, the eucalyptus trees never happened. Uh, I can even prove it by different things, including, uh, including uh, uh, reading um, uh, different Israeli intelligence papers of the Air Force from 1967. And uh, now, oh God, all three are awake. Uh, in 1967, um, and the Israeli pilots said, we knew where every Syrian military base was, nothing to do with eucalyptus trees. 
It is true that different places, the Syrians chose to build their bases by the eucalyptus trees to give them shade. Maybe that's one of the things Ellie reported. Um, in 1967, talking now let's, that will lead us to the accomplishments, uh, after the Golan is liberated within two days, it takes Israel only two days to take over all of the Golan. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol says, um, he says, many Israeli lives were saved thanks to Eli Cohen. Eli gave crucial information which saved Israeli lives in 1967, two years after he was hung. Be due to national security, no one says what is that information, but um, the IDF was able to send less troops to the right places perfectly, thanks to Eli's information. So eucalyptus is not right, is not true, but the fact that he gave crucial information for the Six Day War is true. And that will lead us to our finalizing and then your questions. What were Eli's real accomplishments? Start, I'll start with saying, guys, here it all connects, base powers and intentions. Again, remember that secret and missing spice from 2006, from 2014, from today. If you would ask uh, uh, the president, what's the most important thing? He would want to know what are the intentions of the Iranian government. And imagine you had an Eli Cohen now, maybe we do, I don't know, in the Iranian government. Eli was the greatest military and political analysis uh, analyst Israel had in Syria. Uh, he, he was so well connected. He understood everything happening. And he, this, this affected the Israeli government's decisions. And as I showed you, just in one case out of many, it saved lives. It prevented war, prevented escalation. Uh, Eli was able to really give Israel a perfect picture of what's happening in Syria. That, in my eyes, is the greatest accomplishment. Um, in 1963, there is a secret plan between Syria and Iraq to form a joint military headquarters. Eli reveals this in one of his parties and is able to give Israel crucial information, which will help, help Israel act in different ways to prevent things, this thing from happening. Um, the Jordan River Waterheads Diversion Plan, a, a, a threat to Israel's national security. Uh, Eli reveals it, Eli gives information, and that helps Israel bomb the uh, facilities. Uh, Air Force and in logistics updates. Just to give you an example, um, just for an example, uh, Syria, I think it was 1964, 1963, I apologize if I'm wrong, Syria gets from the USSR 40 new planes. And Israel is very worried about this. Eli is very well connected in the Syrian Air Force. They take him on a tour and Eli says, guys, what, what are all the planes doing here? And the guy said that, oh, you know, the Israelis think we're so good. We only, we don't have the right manpower. We suck. We only can operate four planes, but we have 40 planes. The Israelis are scared of us. Israel now understands that Syria has only four active new planes, okay? That's just an example how well was he connected in the Air Force. The commander of the Syrian logistic branch is also a friend of Eli. Eli sees, is revealed to maps, where are the gas stations, the Syrian, where, where is everything? Where's the ammunition? Everything to do with logistics, Eli constantly takes pictures of and sends it to Israel, okay? Constant updates about logistics, Air Force, just an example. Um, then, uh, a deal, if you remember my promotion video, if you got it, I showed you a picture of a Syrian T-55 tank. These tanks were bought by the USSR to Syria and Eli revealed this deal. Again, today, I, would have I can find out about this in social media, but back then it was like, wow, how did you uh, uh, bring this information? And last but not least, as I spoke about the Golan where I live today, Eli gave five visits to the Golan connections with the commander of the Golan. The commander of the Golan in Eli's first years in Syria, in the first two years, was a very radical guy who kept on trying to lead to escalation. And he shared it with Eli. And Eli was able to report real time every time this guy was planning escalation, which was against the Syrian government. Okay, he tried, you know, for different inner politics reasons to, to uh, bring Israel to escalation. Eli was able, first of all, to make sure that the right people in Syria know about this and stop him, but also to let people in Israel know about it. And he gave, as I said, a lot of information about the 10th Division sitting in the Golan, information which will help Israel save lives in 1967. So that's Eli. This wasn't intense at all, guys, right? Very mellow, right? Chilled. Uh, your questions. We'll do it by chat, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Schusterman. 
Um, we're going to have okay. Rabbi Rabin uh, from Chabad of West Hills uh, filter the chats, but uh, please uh, post your questions in the chat and uh, Rabbi Rabin will filter them. Okay, so this first question, uh, I'll, answer, I'll start with him this question. How did Ellie's wife get the letter? Um, so remember, there was a, a few foreign reporters when Ellie was sentenced to death and he asked to write the letter. Um, the rabbi gave it to the UN and the UN through Europe passed it to Israel. Okay, so that's how she got the letter. Didn't Eli Cohen provide the minefield locations of the Golan? He provided a lot of information about locations of the Golan, minefields, uh, artillery bases, tank locations, morale of the soldiers, outposts, etc. cetera. Uh, lots and lots of information. Are you concerned about Iran? Different topic, I'll say a word about it. Am I concerned? Yes. Um, I can't uh, estimate what's going to happen because again, it's all about one side making miscalculating the other side's intention. Uh, if you ask me, the Iranians will wait uh, for Joe Biden to enter the White House, but this might be, uh, you know, on the other end, if one more guy blows up, we might see the Iranians uh, uh, responding. Um, how did I get all my info about Ellie? Isn't it disclassified? Is it disclassified? Um, Ellie, uh, also following the series, but Ellie before also was a, I can say an, an internationally known figure. Uh, there are books, there are movies, uh, research is done in the IDF, outside of the IDF. Um, all I had to do is really just spend a lot of time in researching and putting the puzzle together and understanding maybe different spots that, that connect to me. Um, the classified things I'm not revealed to. Um, is it possible that there's such a spy today? I, I'll say honestly that it's hard to believe uh, in an era of social media, right? Where I can, or with, uh, with um, AI, where I can just scan through pictures and, and find, and connect things, I can't imagine, but who knows? Is there a possibility of such a spy in Israel? So I think I didn't mention it before, so I'll say one more thing that was revealed actually. Um, it was actually revealed just two months ago. Following this, not two months ago, I'm, I'm thinking about COVID, just uh, half a year ago already. Um, one not, not thing that was less known, Ellie was caught in Damascus. Ellie was called fighter number 566 in the Mossad. Fighter 565 was a German fighter in Cairo who was giving also excellent intelligence about uh, what's happening in the Egyptian regime. And he was caught just a month after Eli. And that uh, led to a question. Uh, there was a program in Israel checking this option and they couldn't, the Mossad denied it, but they couldn't bring proof that maybe there was someone in the Mossad who was, who, who leaked, you understand what I'm saying? Who was a spy for the Syrians and Egyptians. Within a month, your top two agents were captured. That means maybe information was leaking from the inside. So uh, that's regarding that. Okay, I have to go. What was he accused of? He was accused of many, many things. Uh, just to so understand, when Eli was arrested, hundreds of people were arrested because he knew so many people. But um, officially, when he was hung, what it says on him is that Eli Cohen entered uh, a closed military zone, a.k.a. the Golan, uh, without permission, and that's a death penalty. Why didn't it say what everything he said? Because remember the disgrace and the embarrassment for the Syrian regime. If it says he connected, he was very good friends with the president and leaked information. He was very good friends with the chief of staff. So, right, that's a disgrace. So, so they said he entered a closed, he died officially for visiting the Golan. Okay, um, I have to go back. Um, let's see, let's see, Ooh, wow, a lot of things. So that's what he was cute of. How is Israeli intelligence saying she's modifying recruiting criteria based on Ellie's test overconfident or lack of fear and a psychological profile and yet he was so su successful with human. So um, I first of all, when Ellie was tested again two years later, um, they, they, there were question marks about him, but they felt this is the right guy because he was just so good. Um, the thing is, I think if you ask me, I think at first you can see the, we have protocols of Eli's meeting in Israel every time, three times he came back to Israel uh, from his missions. 
and you see the discussions and he, they keep on warning him. Ellie, you're doing an amazing job. But here, this was way too much. At uh, one time, just said, one time in 1964, Ellie is watching a soccer game in Israeli, the Israeli national team loses. And Ellie uses his morse and writes the guy, he's so lonely. He writes the guys in Israel and Mossad, God damn it, can't we beat some other team one time, right? I mean, th that's dangerous for, but, and, and people, what can you say to Eli, right? But this guy is doing such a great job that the, the intelligence community in Israel was addicted to Eli. They could just let go. I mean, yes, it's dangerous. Yes, he's not aware, but he's just so freaking good. I mean, it's, it's gold. So, so they didn't know where to stop. So they were aware of it. They knew that's his weakness. Um, and that's why Eli's family feels that the Mossad didn't protect him enough. They, they felt they should have stopped him and forced him to come back home. Um, okay. Let's see if there's any, I see a lot of, of things here. So let me just see. Um, 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 um. Oh, wow. I see here some people. Okay. Did the Syrians find out that the rabbi was involved about the letter? No, the rabbi, no, the rabbi didn't get in trouble for the letter. Okay. It was something the Syrians had to agree to. They weren't happy about it, but they allowed it to happen to show that they're merciful and Ellie was really brought to justice. Um, so, so that's regarding that. I will say that the Jewish community in Damascus was freaked out uh, when Ellie was arrested because many of the top figures were arrested. The Syrians suspected. They said, okay, he's Jewish. He had connections, but no, he was a lone wolf. Uh, one interesting story I read uh, just a few weeks ago, um, uh, one of the top researchers of Ellie Cohen gives tours here in the Golan. I'll say about it a word at the end. And he, there were three old ladies in the bus who were talking Arabic to each other. And he asked them, what's your story? They said, we lived in Damascus when Ellie was caught. One of them said, my father had a bakery. And one Passover, Ellie came over. Remember, Ellie is living, living an undercover life. And Ellie came over in Passover and said, I'm very hungry. Please, I want to buy some pitas. And, and so he says, she said, my father says to him, sir, we're Jewish. We don't eat bread on Passover, but we have this thing called matzah. That's what we eat. So Eli said, matzah? I don't know what matzah is. Let me taste it. And he went to the side of the room and, and made the blessing and ate matzah and had his, made his mitzvah. Um, so, but the Jewish community didn't know there's a spy there, no connection. So everyone was let go afterwards. Um, Bill asked, when Eli returned, wow, so many questions. <laughs> Uh, when Eli returned to Israel for the last time and he changed radically in his behavior and appeared unstable, why didn't the Israeli government order him not to return to Syria for his sake, his family's sake? That's the million dollar question. That's what is so painful because there, there were discussions here. People were very worried, but Eli, who people trusted him, Eli meets the prime minister, Eli meets the chief of staff and the head of the intelligence branch, and he tells them, yes, things are not so good, they're suspecting me. I just need one last, one, one last chance. Just let me go there for a few more months, half a year, and I come back and it's over. Just let me fulfill my, let me complete my mission. And uh, there were a few events in 1964, which suddenly, if someone was considering in Israel to leave him here, uh, a few events happened in Syria that required ears in the field. And so the Israeli intelligence sent them back. Uh, if you ask his wife today, again, I, I would love to tell you the perfect story, how Nadia is the woman of the hero, and she says, my, my, you know, my husband sacrificed myself for the state of Israel. It's true. She is very proud of his accomplishments, but there's a lot of bitterness there uh, about the last, the last trip. She feels that they sent him to his death, and Eli couldn't stop himself because he was so torn between his identities, but he said someone had to be, you know, the, the responsible adult will say, dude, you did such amazing things, you're staying home. Um, okay, so let me see. Is there any known, privately, is there any known contact between Eli and the Jewish community in Syria? Okay, so that I spoke about. Um, so yes, listen, in some ways, what Hinda says, in some ways, um, every time I read something about Eli's last weeks, last months, I, 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 it's frustrating because I see on one hand, how dedicated it is, but on, on the other hand, it feels like he's, he's just leading himself into death. And we'll, I don't think we'll ever have an answer of, uh, of why did he do it. Uh, but I think one thing, again, talking about the series, the series opens with the rabbi asking him, who are you? And he says, I'm Kamen, I mean Thabit. And the rabbi says to him, my poor boy, you forgot, you don't even know who you are. And Eli's brothers who knew, two of his brothers knew 
one Eli told him and one was working in the Mossad, like you saw in the series, it's true. He was, he understood it's his brother in Damascus and he was uh, uh, following his reports. Um, the two brothers said they felt, you know, Eli was a very quiet, low key person in Israel. And, and suddenly, and, and suddenly uh, this guy, what was he doing in Damascus? He was a party guy in the center of things, making connections. And there was a very big conflict between those two personalities. And he was tearing Ellie from the inside. He comes back to Israel, low key, small apartment, right? Everything's so quiet. And he's the king of the world in the other place. And, and sort of his brother said he fell in love with Kabbalah Amin Thabit. It was like, you know, I wish I could be that in Israel. So that's something that really is emphasized in the series. And maybe that's why also Ellie couldn't stop himself also. Um, I'll end with one last question because I want to conclude. And then I have to take my daughters to daycare. Um, is there any chance the Syrians ever return his body? Very painful question. Um, for the past decade, there's a Syrian civil war happening. Again, using this source of intelligence, I can tell you that since the Syrian regime lost parts of Damascus in 2013 to different organizations, including ISIS and Al-Qaeda, until 2018, there were many rumors on social media about ISIS fighters digging graves in Damascus. Uh, mysteriously, a few years ago, two years ago, Eli's watch was brought back to Israel. How did the Mossad put its hand on the watch? I don't know, but it's, it's, it's Eli's watch for sure. And it was given to Nadia. So the Israeli intelligence never stopped searching for Eli's body. The Syrians would never give it away again they didn't want Eli, think about a funeral in Israel for Eli Cohen, and everyone praises him, etc. And uh, some people said he was in the desert. Uh, what we know, from what we know, is that he was buried in a secret place in Damascus, and today there is a neighborhood built over it. So there were rumors a year ago, uh, an Israeli missing in action soldier uh, came back home, was brought, his body was brought back home after nearly 40 years. And th thanks to the Russian involvement in Syria. And a few days after that, uh, a few days after that, there were rumors that the Russians have Eli Cohen's body. And, and the excitement when Israel was unbelievable. People felt finally it's coming, the story, this painful story is coming to an end and Nadia will have a grave uh, uh, to, 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 to visit and his children and grandchildren. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't true, but Israel all along this year, Israel was Israel was paying, let's put it this way, Israel was paying ISIS fighters to search for Eli's body. Okay, and that's not just rumors. That's something we have evidence of people saying we dug, we saw ISIS fighters digging graves in Damascus, and different bodies were sent to Israel for for fighters, uh, to missing in action idea fighters, and for Eli. So that's regarding that. Um, so, uh, no, I don't think the IDF would prevent his discovery. I think everyone, there's not one person in Israel that doesn't want Eli's body to be brought back home. Uh, he deserves uh, to be here. So what I want to end with is, uh, first of all, I, got, I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, I got to say, I think there's at least one person here who heard another webinar I gave in Eli Cohen. And so they might notice uh, how different it was from last time because you always keep on revealing different things and connecting different things of the picture uh, that gives you uh, new understandings. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I live in the Golan. Uh, what you see here is a statue of Nadia overlooking towards Damascus with her three children. And it says, Mechakim Le'Eli, we're waiting for Eli. This is the final one of eight stops of what we call the Eli Cohen Trail in the Golan. Um, we know several places we have footage or documents or reports that Ellie gave back to Israel that we know Ellie was in the Golan where exactly he stood. So a few years ago, the Ellie Cohen Trail was established. It starts from the Jordanian Syrian Israeli border and it goes up to that statue in the Northern Golan. Uh, one of the teasers I sent you on Motzei Shabbat was filmed at the Syrian headquarters of the Golan where Eli visited at least once and we have documents on that. Um, and so this trail, uh, you can understand up to COVID was very, very popular following the spy. Every one of the hundreds of groups I briefed uh, since the spy came out, 
you know, I come to a group of, of, uh, of, uh, um, of Christian uh, um, pastors, and I'm, I'm supposed to give a geopolitical briefing. I said, hi, my name is Major Sullivan. I want to talk about Iran. I said, one second, Major Sullivan. We're standing in the Golan. Talk to us about the spy, please. I said, what? And every group, the spy, the spy. So I went through the route. It's When you come to Israel next time, aside from the beautiful Golan, I recommend you go through it. Uh, one of the stops is Moshav, a small community called Eliad, Eli forever, named for Eli Cohen. Um, named for Eli Cohen, in honor of Eli Cohen, understanding that this man walked in this land and gave crucial information, as Prime Minister Shkol said, that allowed Israeli troops to liberate the Golan and allows us to live here today. Uh, and I must tell you, when I talk about Eli Cohen, uh, I get very emotional many times, even though he's, for me, just like every other Israeli, you know, there's, there isn't an Israeli that doesn't know Eli Cohen without a spy. There isn't a city in Israel that doesn't have either a street or a school name or a synagogue named for Eli Cohen. He's a national hero and he deserves it. Uh, when you walk around the Golan, uh, and, and I get very emotional talking about it because you understand he was here and you can feel the danger. I mean, you're, you're in the lion's jaw and you're doing it for us. And you did this so we can be safe here in the North and so we can live here. And what I want to end with is a scene from Private Ryan. I, I didn't show any footage today, any videos, because it's very uh, challenging uh, on Zoom, but I will show you one little scene, Saving Private Ryan, just mark with your heads, right? Everyone remembers the, the unbelievable movie with Tom Hanks, right? Uh, the final scene, Captain John finally reaches Private Ryan, if you remember the scene, and then he is hit, and this is the final scene. Earn this, earn it. I didn't show you the picture of Ali being hung, but after we saw the iconic picture in the beginning, then this is a picture of Ellie. And you remember that handsome man, this is Ellie, uh, the picture publicized after he was caught. Look at the eyes, look at the fear, uh, look how much they tortured him. What did this man go through and what price did he pay for us to be able to live here today. And when I walk out of this room in a minute, and my three girls are waiting there, and I think my wife is also waiting there, uh, and I looked in there and I look at them, I'm gonna, I need to ask myself, am I earning it? Am I living a life that's worthy the price that this man paid so I can live here today? So we can all be safe in this country today. Uh, every day, every day, uh, it's a question. Uh, we all need to ask each other, uh, ourselves and each other, are we living, uh, are we fulfilling ourselves? Are we living a meaningful life? Uh, this man did it so we can live, so we can live here and live a meaningful life. And when I look at that picture of Ellie being, of Ellie tortured in Syrian prison, and I know how the story ended, then I look at those words of Captain John and I say, am I earning it? And the people of the Golan, I believe, uh, are doing their best every day to earn it, to make the price worth it. Um, you, so Yaakov. guys, uh, thank you very, very I'm much. Have, I'm gonna have Rabbi Avi close out the event. To... Thank you so much, Yaakov. You are, you were absolutely amazing. You were, we, 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 uh, we had you as a tour guide like two years ago on our men's trip, we were up north in Syria, you took us to the bunker and uh, you're getting better and better. You're like, you're like fine wine, Yaakov. So kola kavod. You've definitely earned it and you're earning it. And we Israel needs and the Jewish people need more people like you that spread the love and the warmth and the excitement about Eretz HaKodesh, the, the holiness of Israel and Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. So thank you very, very much. It's wonderful to see all the people from West Hills on the call tonight and all the other Chabads tonight. Thank you all for showing your support for Eretz Israel, for the holy land of Israel. It's very heartwarming to see that. And thank you, Yaakov, for your time. And enjoy, uh, enjoy the trip with your kids to school and enjoy the beautiful Golan. 
breathe some of the beautiful fresh air for us. And uh, thank you so much, Yaakov. Thank you, Yaakov. And like I said, I look forward to having you back for the, uh, the to talk about the Battle of Telsaki. I've heard you talk about that as well. Valley of Tears, Valley of Tears. Yeah. That's the HBO Max. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. Keep warm, everyone. Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Tov. Bye bye. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you. Shalom. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Loved it. Thank you so much. Very moving. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good news.